Welcome all. Good morning. Not very loud. I think when people start talking, can you hear me now in the back? Welcome. Okay. Welcome to the uh, OLLI debate. Well, I can get it a little closer, possibly. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. I'm Gordon Appel, a long time uh, faculty, volunteer fa faculty person at uh, OLLI at, at uh, DU. I got to stay right in front of it. People are going to continue coming in. And uh, so maybe, well, I think we've filled almost every seat. Channel 9 News is here and they're recording it. I think the university's recording it too. A couple words first about OLLI at DU. Uh, we're part of a, um, not only the University of Denver, but a, a nationwide network of 112 OLLIs that do continuing education for adults at 50 years of age or better around the country. In Denver, we have about 500 courses a year that we offer at uh, several sites of, around the metropolitan area. This is just our southern site in Denver. We have one also in Douglas County up at uh, Park Hill United Methodist and uh, Boulder and, and around. It really depends. It's very sensitive to how close I am. Uh, we believe a formal debate format, which we're going to have today, uh, will be much better than the typical questions and answers with a 30-minute, 30 30-second 30 response, which is what I've been hearing on television. Maybe many of you have too. So we can get an in-depth understanding of what's uh, going on here with this issue. So each side will get 20 minutes, uh, affirmative first, like in all debates, a negative or opposition a second, and then followed by five-minute rebuttal from each side. Uh, we are asking that the uh, uh, two sides not bring up any new information in the rebuttal. The rebuttal is just to refute things that were said by the other side earlier. Um, um, we did invite someone from the city, but they declined to come because it's a ballot issue. Uh, but to get objective information from the city on the, uh, their adopted small area plan and on the development agreement, you can go to the city website and that information is available so you can spend the time with it that you'll need to understand it. Um, by way of introduction, I'm not going to take your, the time from the debate to introduce people in detail. Let me just say over here on this side, we have uh, Kenneth Ho, who represents the Development Partnership, and the Reverend uh, Terry uh, Roberts, Hobart, excuse me, Terry Hobart, the rector of St. Uh, Thomas Episcopal Church in, in uh, Park Hill. And on this side, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Woody uh, Garnsey, who is a retired attorney and a longtime uh, resident of Park Hill. Uh, so, Mr. Ho, are you ready to go ahead? That's all I need to say. And I, I, I will put my hand up with one minute left to go, sitting right here in the front, to, so you can wrap, wrap up. She can come up, yeah, yeah, whenever. Yeah, it's just within your time. I'm a little bit shorter than, oh. Yep. Test, test. Can you guys hear me in the back? Okay. 
Okay. Um. How's that? You guys hear me in the back? Great. Okay. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kenneth Hill. I'm a principal with Westside Investment Partners. And I've lived in Denver for 20 years. My brother's family lives in Colorado. And once the grandchild count got to three, my parents moved here too. Um, it's where I and my wife uh, and have raised our kids and the city in which we plan to retire. This is our home. When given time to present to a group like, like this one today, I've mostly presented the history of the project, the complex uh, agreements, uh, binding legally enforceable agreements on the project, um, t discussing the years of planning that went into make sure that we're getting uh, a comprehensive plan here. But today, I'm gonna put a little bit of that aside. I'd like to speak to you as a dad, as a husband, and as a Denver resident, who drops his kids off down the street. I actually used to live uh, over in Platte Park um, and spent a lot of time over here. Um, and I care deeply about the direction that I think this city needs to go. I see this as uh, the Park Hill Golf Course as a way to challenge ourselves to do things differently. Learning from the mistakes of the past, and this is the challenge that I gave myself when I chose to take on the Park Hill Golf Course project. I set out in hopes of creating a new model for development, one that's based in diversity, equity, and social justice. So t this afternoon, you'll hear some of our opponents um, of 2.0 and make this sound like a very complicated issue. Our opponents today are likely to talk about easements and lawsuits. Mr. Garnsey is a litigator for, um, but I'm here to tell you that whatever you hear this afternoon, and I ask you to remember this, it's really not complicated. A yes vote means 100 acres of new public parks and open space donated by the private landowner, hundreds of affordable for sale units for teachers, essential workers, and first responders. It means deeply affordable housing for those vulnerable to um, homelessness in our low income seniors and low income families. A no vote means the land reverts by law to a golf course, and that means we miss a unique opportunity for safe parks desperately needed affordable housing and a real opportunity to bring economic vitality to a section of the city that has suffered from disinvestment for decades. It is likely that we, that Mr. Garnsey will insinuate that taxpayers own this property. That is not true. Westside owns all 155 acres with investors that include people of color, including myself, a child of Chinese immigrants. I mention this because the history of this land is fraught. It used to have a prohibition against anyone of non-Caucasian descent owning this land. Thank goodness that some things that were supposed to be permanent years ago changed. But let me return to your choice as Denver voters. No matter what you do, you will not litigate the legality of this case. I will tell you everything we have done is uh, related to this project is both consistent with the easement and state and local law, and my opponent will likely disagree with me. He'll, there are lawsuits and votes he claims to force this land to be a park. And again, that is not true. Um, and his lawsuits have been dismissed outright by district court uh, judge just over a year ago. But we will not litigate that today, nor should we. The question needs to be, what do we as citizens of Denver get with a yes vote, and what do you get with a no vote? Well, let's go through the plan, which is the re result of thousands of conversations with residents and the city and more than three years of work. With a yes vote, Denver receives a dedication at no cost to taxpayers of 100 acres of privately owned land that the city does not currently own for parks and open space. All of this green space here that you see, oops, which includes 80 acres over here plus another 20 acres throughout the site. Um, and these are not small tracts of land. For again, Harvard Gulch Park, for example, is just under 62 acres and has a number of drainage areas. Right? The, land is more, the land for parks is more than 50% larger than that. If 2-0 passes, the city then gets to determine what happens on that land and guarantees free public access. As part of our legally binding agreements, the city also gets $24.2 million from us 
to plan, design, and improve that parkland with amenities to benefit the region with playgrounds, ball fields, trails, dog parks, and again, this is at no cost to the taxpayer. This new park will be unique in Denver because it will not be surrounded by roads. As you can see, there's actually the 303 Artway that is separating it from um, development. This, it will be activated and made safe by adjacent housing in a Main Street area, rather than, and rather than being separated by the community by a state highway, the new park and new diverse housing will be separated by a bicycle and pedestrian trail called the 303 Heritage Artway Trail. This is designed by the community and paid for by us that includes art and monumentation that reflects the important cultural history of Northeast Park Hill, centering the neighborhood within the community and honoring its history and artists. People will be able to access this park by car, by bike, and by rail because of the intentional connections um, and improvements paid for by the developer. There will be new residents and families next to this park, not across a highway. These families will be homeowners because of partnerships we have created with Habitat for Humanity. We spent years making this partnership with Habitat for Humanity, giving them, um, go ahead and give them a call and ask them how big this is for them. This is the quote from uh, Heather Lafferty, who's the executive director of Habitat. We're donating nearly eight acres of land to Habitat and Elevation Community Land Trust so that they can bring their expertise in creating homes for our teachers essential workers and first responders to this community. At least 300 new income restricted affordable homeownership opportunities for families. And just to put that in perspective, the city and county of Denver has fewer than 2,000 of these types of units. This community alone will increase that supply by over 15%. It will mean, it will also be combined with a preference policy and targeted marketing by Habitat to target those who live in the neighborhood or those who have been displaced to actually bring people back to the community. And with Habitat's comprehensive suite of services to help with financial literacy um, and first-time home buyers. Our opponents um, may say that this can happen somewhere else and that there's other land. Um, they're not opposed to affordable housing, just not here. Well, then why hasn't affordable home ownership existed elsewhere in the city? This is not typical. This is, so what we're doing here now is new. Something else that we're doing that is new is that we're donating two acres of land for a new grocery store in this area, which is a food desert. The community has suffered for decades as two grocery stores in the area shuttered as demographics in the area shifted. Where else is someone going to donate this much land for a grocery store? Our opponents cannot guarantee that. This commitment by us is in writing, binding, and enforceable, and at no cost to taxpayers. It, and it doesn't end there. We're doing something that has never been done before in Colorado. Um, we are creating what's called a property tax anti-displacement fund for residents that live within a half mile of the site. Let me tell you how this works. In order to avoid involuntary displacement of low-income homeowners around the site, we will pay the incremental property taxes associated with their property value increases for the next eight years. Any household within a half mile that makes less than 60% of the area median income, about $40,000, um, if their property taxes increase, we will pay that incremental amount for eight years from a 2024 baseline. We will be paying taxpayers who don't even live in this community millions of dollars. The Denver Post said that they couldn't quantify the value of this. Well, let me give you some guideposts. There are more than 2,000 low-income homeowners in the area surrounding the golf course. What is the value of keeping them in their homes, these long-time long homeowners? I would say it's priceless. Again, at no cost to the taxpayer, and I can guarantee this is not help happening elsewhere in Denver or in Colorado. There are so many more community benefits, more than twice the required affordable housing for families, seniors, and people transitioning from homelessness, a city where the top issues are homelessness and housing, commercial spaces for small and BIPOC businesses, again, at no cost to the taxpayer, and according to the Post, this has no value. According to our opponents, this is business as usual. Well, I respectfully disagree. Trying to tap into an overall anti-developer sentiment doesn't change the fact that this is a unique opportunity. There may, and there may, uh, opponents may say that there's no urgency on the issue. 
that we need to study it more, and once open space is gone, it's gone. Well, let's talk about the impact of the daily displacement occurring in this city. Once families are forced out of their community, their kids lose six months of academic achievement. They're dislocated from their community, friendships are severed, community is lost. The need is now perhaps no more apparent than by a recent endorsement by the Denver Classroom Teachers Association. This is the, they joined more than 30 other organizations endorsing yes on 2-0 because they realize the impact of families leaving Denver, of their staff not being able to live where they teach, and ultimately the impact of under-enrollment that leads to school closures. The schools around this defunct golf course have more than 500 empty seats because families with kids cannot afford to live in the area. The families that do are deprived of access to healthy food as a part of a food desert. Are we going to let another generation live in these conditions or leave the area completely? We can't get those people back either, except with our plan. But our opponents don't talk about that. In fact, all of the opponents um, against this project, pretty much they all own a home. And, and this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. A yes vote brings all of these benefits. Otherwise, it goes back to a golf course and the city and families in the areas lose. This is far from business as usual and I respectfully ask you for you to vote yes on 2-0. Good afternoon. Well, it's great to be here with you today and I can't work. There we go. So my name is Reverend Terry Hobart. I'm with St. Thomas Episcopal Church in Park Hill and I'm here representing the Park Hill CBA Coalition. And let me tell you a little bit about how I got involved with this. In 2020, the initiative was on the ballot and to me it, it initially seemed like a no-brainer because I really care about creation and I really am opposed to gentrification. And so I didn't give it much thought. And then uh, several people began reaching out to me. One was the program developer, a uh, program director of Episcopal Relief and Development out of San Francisco. He said, hey, are you paying attention to what's going on with the Park Hill Golf Course? This is one of the most important opportunities for community organizing and justice-oriented redevelopment in the country. It's like, wow, that's interesting. A couple weeks later, I was invited to a luncheon for clergy, the, uh, the senior vice president of uh, diversity and equity for the Habitat for Humanity International had flown out from Atlanta. She had convened clergy to say, hey, we need your moral voice. This is an important thing that's going on. This is an opportunity for justice-oriented redevelopment. So that really got my attention. And so I really began to try and understand this issue. And I know those of you who have been paying attention to it know that it is complicated, it is convoluted, and it is controversial. And I didn't want to jump in unless I knew what I was jumping into. And so I read everything I could read. I talked to everyone I could find to talk to me about it. I watched videos. I pulled the legal agreements and had my own attorneys review them. And, and I began to talk to local neighbors to faith leaders in Northeast Park Hill. And here's what I found out. I found out that the voice that was being drowned out, that was not being listened to in this entire conversation, were the people who had lived there for decades. All the noise, all the disturbances that have come because of the people who are for development and against development and the people that hate the Hancock administration, like, yeah, all that's real but they were drowning out what the people who actually lived there wanted and needed. And this is a neighborhood, Clayton, Ilaria Swansea, Northeast Park Hill, they have been underserved, disenfranchised, victims of institutionalized systemic racist policies for years. They live in the middle of urban decay. The, Park Hill, the city park golf course is closer than a golf course. You know how I know that? Because I live five blocks from the golf course. These are my neighbors. And so I decided to join in with their community organizing efforts. And I am so excited about what we have accomplished. Because what we have been able to do is work with the developer. And I, I love Ken, I know him now. I'm not in his pocket either. 
But I'll tell you this, I didn't know if I liked him up front. I was really skeptical of him. And I don't know what his intentions were when he started, but I can tell you he knows the people in that neighborhood now. He cares about them as much as I do. And he and his group have worked with us to create a really exciting model for community-oriented redevelopment that's based in justice. So what is a community benefits agreement? Well, it's a legally binding, enforceable third-party contract. It's between community nonprofits and the developer. And they're used all over the country in areas that are at risk for displacement and justification to ensure that the development also benefits the local residents. And so let me tell you a bit about what our community benefit agreement actually includes. First of all, it addresses the needs that were identified by the people who live in those neighborhoods around the golf course after conversations with over 350 people that live there. And it is a legally binding commitment. It's designed to prevent further displacement and to revitalize this community. It guarantees 650 permanently affordable housing units. And most of those will be family-oriented affordable housing units because that's what the people in that neighborhood said that they need. That means that this developer right here, he cannot like buy his way out of the commitments he made to the city because he also made them to our coalition and we can sue him if he doesn't do it, okay? We did that because we have learned from what's happened in Five Points, what's happened in Lowry, what has happened in Central Park, and we don't want to repeat that. It, it commits, it gives us an opportunity to have a grocery store in a food desert. It commits hundreds of thousands of dollars to community services in job and workforce development. It provides subsidized retail rental space for locally owned BIPOC and women owned businesses. This is by far the strongest, most comprehensive community benefit agreement executed to date. And we are proud of it. And it is drawing interest from communities all over the country. This agreement represents the voice of the longtime residents in, the, in this historic African American neighborhood. It obtains guarantees and concessions to prevent displacement, and it helps to not only retain the spirit and the complexion of this neighborhood, but to revitalize it. Most importantly, this agreement runs with the land. That means if the developer sells it, these commitments are still in place to whoever buys it. This project is an elegant solution. It is a win-win for many constituencies. Yes, the developer is going to make money. That's part of the reason they develop, right? But the city is going to get much needed housing. It's going to get much needed affordable housing. It's going to get additional revenue from property taxes. A new large park, the fourth largest park in the city. Much needed infrastructure in the neighborhood in the form of upgraded intersections. It's going to connect Clayton and Northeast Park Hill so that we'll have walkability. It's going to give us roads and sidewalks. The local residents have protection against displacement. There's pathways for economic growth and new generational wealth. There's guaranteed permanent rental and for sale affordable housing units. All of us, all of us are going to benefit from the reduction in car traffic and the CO2 by placing by placing this high density housing next to public transit and not displacing current residents who live there and work in Denver to more affordable cities or more affordable suburbs way outside the city limits. And we're also gonna all benefit from the biodiversity and the pollinator like sites that the, are gonna be installed by Butterfly Pavilion, by the thousands of trees that will be planted in the park and throughout the neighborhood. This project is truly a collaboration of the community and the developer. Just look at all the endorsements on the Yes for Parks and Home website. It's well thought out, it's intentional, and it is my deepest hope that the, the seemingly justified animosity that people have towards the city and the developers do not take away 
the voice and the agency of this parentally underserved community. They have worked so hard to create this vision and to obtain these benefits. Thank you. Gordon, it's telling me I'm not connected. Right, but it's telling me. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Woody Guernsey. Uh, as Gordon said, I'm a long. I'm actually a Denver native and long-term Park Hill neighbor uh, neighborhood member, and I'm also uh, a part of the grassroots citizens group Save Open Space Denver. I'm here today speaking as a representative of this grassroots citizens group Save Open Space Denver. And I'm speaking in opposition to the Hancock administration's referred question 2-0 that the city council referred to the voters on January 23rd. I want to start by just briefly orienting all of us to the Park Hill Golf Course land. Uh, this is a, a beautiful picture. It's an aerial view looking west. 
uh, and you can see downtown. Uh, it's a, a pretty terrific uh, view of where we are, and uh, Colorado Boulevard is right here, right along there. Okay, sorry. Uh, so here, this is a, a little better view of it. And you can see, here's where the land is. Here's Colorado Boulevard. Here's Smith Road, Interstate 70. And over here is a massive development that will occur around the 40th and Colorado train station and, and also going west. So just a, a few other photographs, I think, will give you an idea of what this land looks like. This is a beautiful, uh, uh, pond and wetlands area. Uh, another view during the summer looking west, a beautiful winter view, and here again is uh, the aerial view. I want to give you a short history of this land. This was a farm that was owned since the late 19th century by one of the first Denver real estate barons. His name was George Clayton, and it transferred to the Clayton Trust on his death in 1899. It was operated by the trust as a golf course from 1931 to 2019. And in, in the year 1989, we voters voted to put a $2 million tag in a bond issue designed to purchase the land for the city. In fact, that never happened. And in 1997, in the Wellington Webb administration, the Clayton people came to the city and said they needed money. And what that resulted in was an agreement between the city and Clayton, which created the conservation easement that's at issue today. Uh, that, by that e agreement, the city received, or city paid $2 million, and Clayton forever gave up the development rights for that land. That's what a conservation easement is. Starting soon after, uh, excuse me, in 2019, Westside, uh, Mr. Ho's company, uh, purchased the, land, but it was subject to this conservation easement. They knew it couldn't be developed. And soon after that purchase, the Hancock administration began working with Westside to try to break the easement and open the land to development. And this brings us to why we're here today talking about referred question 2.0. So what's a conservation easement? A conservation easement is an interest in real property governed exclusively by the Colorado Conservation Easement Statute. This is an interest in real property, just like the deed to the city and county building downtown. According to the conservation easement statute, a conservation easement puts limits on uses of land to maintain the land, and I'm quoting, predominantly in a natural, scenic, or open condition, or for wildlife habitat, or recreational, or other use or condition, consistent with the protection of open land, environmental quality, or life-sustaining ecological diversity. That's what a conservation easement is. There can be a variety of permitted uses under a conservation easement, like a golf course, but uses must be consistent with the conservation purposes of the easement. So what are the conservation purposes of this easement? They are found in the grant of easement paragraph number two, and they are to maintain the land's scenic and open condition and to preserve the land for recreational use. And what are the permitted uses? The permitted uses are a golf course uh, and other uses like ball fields and tennis courts. As I'll soon explain, here's a critical legal question related to the deceptive and inaccurate language in this ballot initiative that you're gonna be asked to vote on. The question is, if the conservation easement is preserved, does the land always have to be a golf course? That's the false narrative that Westside and the city have been putting out. The answer is absolutely no. If Westside doesn't want to operate a golf course, it and the city can amend the conservation easement 
to change the permitted uses as long as those permitted uses are consistent with the open space and recreational conservation purposes of this unique conservation easement. Since Westside has bought the land, it and the city have spread this false information. I said the Colorado statute governs all Colorado conservation easements, like the Park Hill Golf Course one. How does the statute permit terminating, releasing, extinguishing, or abandoning a, the Park Hill Golf Course conservation easement? The statute requires the landowner and the city to go to district court to secure, to secure a court order that based on changed conditions on or surrounding the land, it is now impossible, that's the word in the statute, to continue fulfilling the open space and recreational conservation purposes. Have Westside and the city gone to court to get such an order? No. And in fact, are there any facts that would support getting such an order? Again, the answer is no. So why should you vote no on referred question 2-0? There are many reasons, but I only have time to discuss uh, 10 that I'd like to put before you. <laughs> we'll do it quickly. We'll do it quickly. So e even if you might be unsure about whether you think the Park Hill Golf Course easement and open space should be preserved, you should still vote no. And the reason is that the ballot language written by the Hancock administration and referred to voters by city council should be neutral. This ballot language... Sorry. Uh, and th but this ballot language is not neutral and it couldn't be more biased toward a yes vote. First of all, it contains language which reflects this false choice between either a golf course, forever, or development. That's not true. I've told you why that's not true. It also contains propaganda language drafted by the Hancock administration to support development. And I'll show you that language in just a moment. So uh, just very quickly, the top of this has the, uh, uh, this is the ballot language, and you'll see that it uh, talks about the golf course use. They're trying to set it up so that people will vote no because nobody wants a golf course. It also has this language here about affordable housing, which is part of their propaganda piece. This is the, what was passed uh, by the voters in 2021 and 301. And you'll see it very simply talks about uh, the need for a vote if there's ever going to be commercial or residential building on, a des on land protected by a city-owned conservation easement or building uh, on, uh, on land that's protected by an easement. Very simple language. This is the language that would properly be on the ballot. We went to city council and said, this language is totally biased in favor of development. It should be actually, if they want to put it on the ballot, something very simple that just tracks the language of 301, which says that voters should need to decide if they're going to authorize commercial and residential development on privately owned land, like the Park Hill Golf Course, uh, protected by a city-owned conservation easement, or construction on, the, uh, on that same land. They haven't done that. For that very reason alone, you should vote no. Secondly, you should vote no because Westside and the city have failed to comply with the requirements of the Colorado Conservation Easement Statute. As I explained before, those requirements have very strictly set out what you have to do in order to terminate a conservation easement. Third, you should vote no because abandonment of the easement by the city would constitute a multi-million dollar gift from the Denver taxpayers to Westside in violation of Article 11, Section 2 of the Colorado Constitution. That constitutional provision prevents donations from a public entity like the city of Denver to a private developer like Westside. And this, un this unconstitutional gift would be essentially the fair market value of the city-owned development agreements that we own as taxpayers. And those are conservatively estimated to be $60 million at least the Denver Post on Sunday thought it was $184 million. That's an unconstitutional gift from taxpayers to this developer. Fourth, you should vote no because particularly in the face of climate change, 
The park preservation of this space is critical for the health and environmental benefit of all Denver citizens. The National Weather Service data shows that Denver suffers from one of the nation's most severe heat island effect. In 2020, Denver is nationally ranked eighth worst out of large metropolitan areas for ozone pollution, and last year the EPA downgraded Denver from the category of serious to severe for ozone. Number five, you should vote no because our rapidly growing and densifying city is losing its urban open spaces and is falling behind nationally in park space per resident. Excluding undeveloped land around DIA, approximately half of Denver is now paved over or built up, compared to about 19% in the mid-1970s, and only about 8.5% of our land is now used for parks and recreation, compared to cities like Washington, D.C. with about 24%, San Francisco about 21%, San Diego about 19 Portland, Oregon about 18%. Number six, you should vote no because the city's own commission study found that the neighborhoods around this land, uh, in fact, needed 183 and a half acres of land to meet the national average of 13 acres per 1,000 residents, and because the city should buy this land, this 155 acres, for a new regional park, paying its encumbered value, that's with the easement on place, of no more than $5 million. That could be done with the, the Measure 2A sales tax money that we all approved a few years ago for the purpose of park acquisition and, main, and maintenance. To put that in perspective, in 2019, the city paid $5 million for about two acres of land in the Southeast Denver University Hills neighborhood for a park. So as shown beautifully on this slide, the land could basically be a turnkey park. You wouldn't have to do anything to it to turn it into a park. Terrific improvements could be added to the park over a period of time. Playgrounds, tennis courts, basketball courts, community gardens, un unlimited ideas that people could come up with of what to do with that beautiful land. Number seven, you should vote no because needed housing should be built around, not on the land. And Mr. Ho was talking about this very topic, but I want you to see what those yellow areas. We've identified two development groups that have assembled 36 acres of land here around the park, around the light rail station. And this, this all eventually, not in my lifetime, but in the lifetime of my children and grandchildren, there will be one massive mixed development all the way from here to Rhino. It'll all be connected south of I-70. There's currently a, a for affordable housing project at 38th and Holly uh, by Dell West Company that will put 250 new affordable units here. And the Urban Land Conservancy owns seven acres of land here, which it was planning to do for affordable housing until Westside came up with its plans. But now that land is still available for affordable housing. That was going to be a project of about 400 affordable units. That's where housing should go, not on this land. You should vote no because constructing buildings from four to 12 stories along Colorado Boulevard would create a highway canyon along Colorado Boulevard. What that would do would be to block all the existing beautiful westerly views from this park that they talk about. It's gonna be blocked by buildings 12, eight and four stories high along Colorado Boulevard where the canyon would be. I wanna show you what this looks like from a graphic point of view. This, the upper left corner is uh, what it would look like with eight and 12 story buildings go looking north on Colorado Boulevard. The next two uh, images show what this would look like with those same buildings looking south from 40th and Colorado Boulevard. And you can see behind this through the, through the purple what's being covered up and it's, it's grass and it is trees. You should also vote no because in its planning process that has cost, cost taxpayers over a million dollars, the city planning and development department admittedly, admittedly considered Westside, not Denver taxpayers and citizens, its client. That's who the city's working for, not the citizens. And therefore the planning process that Mr. Ho talked about was a sham with a predetermined pro-development outcome. 
And I want to give you a few examples of what happened. The hand-picked steering committee for the sham, sham planning process was predominantly made up of pro-development people. The sham planning, planning process myopically addressed planning only for the 155 acres of this land, ignoring all the other land around that area. We consider that planning malpractice. How are you going to look at 155 acres in a vacuum and come up with a meaningful plan? The sham planning process failed to include any meaningful analysis of the health and environmental benefits of maintaining the 155 acres as open space. The sham planning process failed to include any traffic study, any traffic study at all, of the impact of putting 2,500 residences on that piece of land. You go drive there now, and you'll see it's already a mess. The sham planning process fa also failed to include any meaningful discussion of the real estate tax impact on market rate housing in this area caused by the metropolitan district funding for the infrastructure. And the sham planning process ignored the excellent Park Hill Golf Course supermarket that's right near the light, rain sta light rail station, which is a fabulous uh, piece of, uh, a fabulous uh, grocery store. You should also vote no because developers shouldn't be able to buy Denver with an army of high paid lobbyists, multiple deceptive and misleading glossy mailings, and door to door handouts and expect expected TV. Did you see any 12-story buildings or four-story buildings in the graphics Mr. Ho showed you? They're not there. As the Denver Post editorial board wrote last Sunday, voting yes on referred question 2-0 would be, quote, a sweetheart deal, just not for Denver taxpayers. Please follow the Denver Post editorial board recommendation and join Save Open Space Denver and me and vote no on this referred measure 2-0. Thank you. Yeah, that's kind of that one. Okay, now, now we have five minutes each for rebuttal, starting with uh, Mr. Ho. You want to plug in again? Yes, on would help. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So um, thank you again uh, for your time. And um, you know, we understand, uh, uh, you know, again, while there, are, Mr. Garnsey spent a lot of time talking about legalities, um, we're not going to litigate that today. And I'll tell you that uh, my, uh, my attorneys and the city attorney uh, disagree with his legal analysis and um, but again we're not talking about that right now we, we need to actually talk about why this pro this proposal exists one is because we wanted to make sure that the voters of Denver understood what the options were in front of them right the options are because we own the land that it could either remain a golf course or the city can get all of these different benefits, right? Let's talk about why um, Mr. Garnsey and, and folks say that it's not worth it. Well, because he wants more parks. We understand we've got 100 acres of parks and I'm not sure that I understand what can be in um, 100 acres that can't, of park that can't be in 155 acres of park. But at the same time, because of the easement, and we recognize what the language was, the city and the owner needs to compromise about how this works, right? In order to get what the city wants, and in order uh, that we both have to agree, the city cannot 
control what we do with our property um, unless we all agree to that, right? That's the, what that three-year planning process went through. And so what did we, what does the city get? Well, we donate 100 acres for parks and open space. We donate eight and a half acres for for sale, affordable and permanent supportive housing. Two point acres are sold for far below market value to nonprofits for senior and family affordable housing. And this is hundreds and hundreds of units for folks who do not currently, cannot currently afford homes in Denver. And we donate two acres of land for a future grocery store. Now, the Denver Post analysis made one pretty significant flaw in their analysis, which is, is to be expected. They didn't understand that 16 acres of the 55 acres is actually roads and utilities. And so when you take all of that together, 130 of the 155 acres is going towards public parks, public roads, affordable housing that we desperately need in this city, and grocery stores for this community that has been a food desert for decades, right? Leaving 25 acres. And so um, regardless of how you look at it, um, the number of acres that the city gets for purposes that are support their objectives a lot, um, is far larger than the op opposite. In addition to that, there's $24 million of capital improvements that we as the developer are donating towards park planning, capital improvements, and infrastructure improvements. We're spending nearly $60 million on public road and infrastructure that again, we are donating back to the city after we do it, after we invest in it. And in terms of what the affordable housing is worth, again, I would say that the affordable housing is priceless for everybody who gets to live there. The affordable housing, and this is really what it's all about. Our city is in a crisis, okay? It's not that we need a couple hundred here or a couple hundred there. We need 50,000 units out there, right? 50,000 units of housing is what affordable housing is, what the city is short. And so we're not saying that we're solving it all in one place, but we're certainly contributing more and we're doing twice as much of, of what's required. So when um, the opponents talk about other land, there's how are they, you know, are they going to be making a more comprehensive policy around this? I doubt it um, because in order to do this, we had to donate so much land to make it happen. So again, we value that because of 300 additional affordable units, the city does $250,000 of a per uh, in lieu fee per unit. That comes out to more, uh, 75 million on a very conservative basis. And then again, I would just say, how do you value maintaining nearly 2,000 residents, long-term residents of the community who have been there for decades? How do you value keeping them in their homes? Again, I would say that that's priceless. How do you value capacity building for small and local businesses that t do not have a place to, to operate? How do you value talking to youth in that community and hearing that the, commu that the city voted that views and blades of grass were more important than them being able to stay at their school, than them being able to stay in their neighborhood. How do you value that? And I would say that, the, that what we're doing here represents equity, it represents fairness, and it represents a really good deal, not only for the residents of Denver, but for the folks who live in and around the, the area, the neighborhood surrounding the golf course. Again, appreciate your time. We encourage you, we think that uh, voting yes is very simple. It's for new public parks and affordable housing. Voting no will return this land to a golf course. Thanks so much. I need to point out is once again Mr. Ho is talking about the fact that if this is if you don't pass their 
requested, and the Hancock administration's requested uh, measure, this will always have to be a golf course. That's absolutely wrong legally. They bought this land subject to the conservation easement that they knew protected it. Mr. Ho doesn't want to talk about the conservation easement, but that is an asset. It's a real estate asset that we all own. It's a unique asset in Denver because Denver, as I said, is dwindling in its, par in its park and open space. We're growing. And pretty soon we're going to be a very dense city. Nobody's going to want to live in. I came here after finishing law school in 1971, and I established this. This is our family home because we want Denver to look like the Denver I grew up in when I was born here 100 years ago. <laughs> so again, Mr. Ho refuses to point at, address the fact that this beautiful project they're talking about with happy kids playing in, on green space, it's going to be cut completely blocked from the west by 12-story and 8-story and 4-story buildings. Nobody wants that. You don't want it on Colorado Boulevard. You don't want it anywhere. West Side won't develop this land. <coughs> they bought the Loretta Heights land, and they quickly, after tearing down all the trees in the land, except a few around the, the, uh, the Pancreta Heights uh, building, they flipped it. They fl already flipped the land. The West Side won't be doing it. One final point. The, the Reverend talked about this community benefits agreement. I need to address this, because this agreement was negotiated in secret they wouldn't tell us who the members of this committee were. They met for months. They still won't tell us who the me members are. They have no power to enforce an agreement. No, no new information in the report. Uh, hard to know what that means. OK, well, in, in any event, I am rebutting what the Reverend said. I think that's appropriate, because the Reverend tr talked about this community benefits agreement as this great thing that supposedly was negotiated by three or 400 people. It was negotiated in secret by a group who wouldn't even identify themselves. They wouldn't even give us a copy of it when they went to city council on January 23rd. And that there's no established organization that could ever have the resources to enforce that agreement. But since we don't even know what it says, I can't respond to what the Reverend said about it. So I just urge you to think long and hard before you turn this land over to development and give up this incredible city-owned real estate asset of the park golf course land. All the development he's talking about should be done on land outside the Park Hill golf course land, not on it. Th thank you very much. Test. Test. Thank you both. Uh, now we're going to go to questions uh, from uh, the the audience, and I'll call on them. If you, would you like to approach, and if you'd like to s come back up here, we will. Uh, well, I can hand the mic back and forth. I don't know where that one actually works, but these. This one works. We could just stay here, and then Woody doesn't. We, then we don't need to yeah, walk I around. I can pass it back and forth. Yeah. Instead of giving a speech, would you ask a question with all due respect? A question. Well, just ask a question. E either, either of them.
I could take a stab at that. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'll just use an example of Fox Park, which you said is a huge development, right? Um, Fox Park, uh, one, uses tax increment financing, right? And so it actually takes away, uh, as opposed to our development, it doesn't, uh, we, we don't take any tax money out of the coffers of the city and county of Denver. That one does. I'll describe to you what their community benefits agreement looks like. 6% affordable housing, no requirement for for sale, and $2 million of community benefits. Okay? We are doing four times the amount of affordable housing. We are creating Let's see, I think they only are doing 10% of, of, of parks, which is what's required out there. So we're doing multiple times more than that. The affordable housing issue in Denver, as I mentioned, is not a couple hundred housing units here and there. It's 50,000. And I understand that as I look out on this um, you know, great crowd and appreciate that you're all here, that I guess I could ask the question, how many of you are homeowners? Maybe I should ask the other question. How many of you are not homeowners? Okay, right? And so I, 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 I respectfully say that there is a, a situation in Denver right now where people are desperate for housing, okay? Um, we need to build it, and I'm not saying that we need to build it at all costs. We need to do it thoughtfully. In the housing ecosystem, that we put together in this plan has everything from housing for folks who are transitioning from homelessness, senior housing for low-income uh, low seniors, housing for families, right? We, and that, that is something that we specifically put in because probably in Fox Park, with their 6%, that's gonna be built in, the, in terms of how many one and two bedroom units are built there at the market rate level. It's probably gonna be a lot of one bedroom units. Our development through our, as, as we talked about, with Habitat and our family size units will be two, three, four, and more bedroom units, right? It'll be for sale, the, the elusive missing middle housing that just doesn't exist in Denver right now. That's what's so unique about this. On top of that, on on top of that, <laughs> we're doing comprehensive um, support through our affordable housing partners, Habitat for Humanity, Elevation Community Land Trust, Brothers Redevelopment, and Volunteers of America, all who have wraparound services, whether it's first-time ownership support, whether it's a hotline for renters and homeowners in who, who may be experiencing challenges associated with it. And that kind of an ecosystem is not the normal thing in Denver. This is the opportunity that we're doing there and we're donating all of that land to make that happen. I will also note, just because um, Woody brought it up as, as new and about Loretto Heights. Loretto Heights um, is a development that we did in, in Southwest Denver. And he talks about the trees we cut down, but he ignores that the priorities that we identified at that time. I probably don't The priorities that the community identified at the time was historic preservation of the buildings, affordable housing, and open space, right? But in that order. The first project out of the ground was Pancreatia Hall, which was 75 affordable units, um, half of which were family size, and it just won a historic Denver Preservation Award, a Denver Design Award, and, a, and Project of the Year. Right? On top of that, we've negotiated with Urban Land Conservancy to create Commune, a food-anchored communal area that's supporting folks in the neighborhood. So I'll stand by what we did at Lira Heights. It is a model for equity and for affordable housing and what we need to put out there and is consistent with the types of projects that we do. Thank you. Okay, just real quickly, that was a long, long answer. I just urge you, 
think about where this kind of project should go that Mr. Ho is talking about. It doesn't go on land that's protected uniquely as open space. There has to be leadership in the city, just like there was back in the Spear era. If we weren't for Robert Spear, we wouldn't have parks in Denver. If we didn't have Wellington Webb having purchased this conservation easement in 1997, there wouldn't be anything to talk about today. But we bought that unique conservation easement and it needs to be preserved. And I urge you, if you agree with us, take a look. We've got lawn signs in the back. Love to have you take a lawn sign with you. Thank you. We've got another five minutes. Uh, I see that one and then this one. What, what does it cost? I mean, what, the average price in Denver is over 600000 So is it like 500000 <laughs> Yeah. No, it's a great question. It's a, it's a good and a common question. So, oh, can I? Um, so the, the way that affordable housing is determined, and that's why we call it income restricted. So what affordable housing is, is housing that is affordable for whoever the household is, and actually I can provide, if I can provide data, but um, now I won't do it. Um, so that you're spending less than 30% of your household income on your housing costs, which include, if you're renting, that would be rent, utilities, and any fees associated with it. If you're owning a home, it would be your principal interest, taxes, insurance, um, and any other fees associated as well. So that would mean, for example, when we're talking about a 50% AMI unit, that would mean that you need to qualify by earning less than 50% of area median income. So for an individual, that's $40,000. And then you would spend less than 30% of that $40,000 on all of your household fees. Quick math on that, and the reason why I picked $40,000, $40,000 times 30% is 12,000, which means 12,000 per year divided by 12, 1,000 per month, right? Um, I usually can't do that kind of math in my head. But at the same time, so that's what it's saying. At 50%, someone would be, be paying less than $1,000 in rent. For Habitat for Humanity, they're targeting 60% of AMI and above from that. 60% of AMI means for a family, I'll use a family of four, earning $70,000 would be able to afford the, that unit. Now, I don't know anyone who's earning $70,000 who can buy a home in this market, right? That is the depth of, now, the reason why I can't do all that math in my head is because, okay, $70,000 interest rates, it means, you know, right, because it's principal interest taxes insurance, it means that whenever they're selling that unit, they will essentially buy down the price so that someone making 60% of AMI will not spend more than 30% of their income for their housing cost. And so it's actually really income restricted associated with that. Does, did that answer your question? I, I, I can answer it much, much more simply than that. It's basically that you don't pay more than 30% of your total income. Right. And if you work full time at the minimum wage in Denver, or let's say even if you make $20 an hour, not the minimum wage, you can afford $1,000 a month for housing. You work full time, $1,000 a month for housing. Most people can't, is, there's no housing available for $1,000 a month. But if you qualify for one of those uh, affordable units, the rest of it's made up either the, the owner charges you less or it's made up by a federal subsidy or a state or, or city subsidy. I'm sorry to say we're out of time. We have a class at one o'clock. <laughs>